if you had asked me what my favorite Bible story was when I was in the kindergarten Sunday school class 55 years ago, I would have probably told you that it was Zacchaeus. I was fairly proud of the fact that I could pronounce his unusual name. And it is a cool sounding name. I mean, she just said Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. I mean, that sounds cool. And um, I could relate to Zacchaeus because uh, I was short. Although, you know, I was taller than most kids at age five, but I was short in relation to the rest of the world, and I was keenly aware of how short I was, and that kind of bothered me. And then on top of that, uh, Zacchaeus climbed trees, something that I did occasionally, and I actually dreamed of doing a whole lot more. It's amazing what you could do in a tree. You could build a house in a tree. You could swing from it. Trees were just awesome. I loved trees. I still love trees, but when I was five, I even loved trees. And um, then Zacchaeus also liked Jesus, and I knew that I liked Jesus. And to top it all off, Zacchaeus had his own song, which we would sing in Sunday school, and so I thought that it would be good for us to sing it. And if any of the children want to come help me sing this song... <laughs> Do you know it, Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as a Savior walked that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I mean, it's a great, it, it, it's great that kids are learning it, and, and they're doing so at their own level, but some of us get stuck there. We see this as a Sunday school story, with a Sunday school song, a story about how Jesus loves short people who climb trees, and, and we never get around to digging a little deeper into what it's actually all about. So that's what I want to do this morning. I, I want to dig or, or peel back another layer on this story. And I want us to see the story of Zacchaeus that, that it is just as relevant to us as adults as it is to the children. So let's start with another look at the passage itself. This time in, in the authorized points to the paraphrase. I'm going to read it for you. After healing the blind beggar on the outskirts of town, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through on his way to Jerusalem. Zacchaeus was a well-known shady character in Jericho. He'd become quite wealthy because of his position as the head tax collector. Zacchaeus was also quite short, which made it difficult to see the passing Jesus. A lot of people had come out to catch a glimpse of Jesus, for his miracles and teaching had made him famous. But short Zacchaeus was being crowded out. He solved the problem by running ahead of the horde and climbing a sycamore tree so he could see the approaching Jesus. Zacchaeus didn't have much dignity left, for everyone knows that grown men don't run or climb trees. As Jesus came to the spot below Zacchaeus' perch, he looked up, saw him, and said, Zacchaeus, today is your day. Get yourself down here right now. I want to be a guest in your home. The elated tax collector scrambled down the tree 
and enthusiastically welcomed Jesus. Those who figured out what was going on started to commit. He's going to accept the hospitality of a scumbag sinner. Disgusting. The embarrassed Zacchaeus acknowledged the legitimacy of the crowd's reaction in his response to Jesus. Look, Lord, I'm a changed man. I hereby give half of what I have to the poor, and whatever I have swindled will be repaid four times over. Jesus said, Today is the day of salvation for this man and his household. Obviously, this kind of faith shows that Zacchaeus is to be counted among the true children of Abraham. The uberman has come to seek and save those who are lost. Wow, I mean, can, can you feel the, the, the tension and the transformation in the story? Uh, I'm sure that some in the crowd uh, felt suspicion. Yes? Can you, do you think they were suspicious? Or were they uh, real happy for Zacchaeus? I mean, no, they, they were probably pretty suspicious. But Jesus accepted the change at face value. This is no less a sign of the kingdom of God than the healing of the blind man that occurred in chapter 18 immediately preceding this story. And Jesus uses it as the occasion to summarize his whole mission. Now some scholars suggest that verse 10 is actually the key verse for the book of Luke. The, 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 the hint upon which the entirety of the gospel of Luke swings. Verse 10, the uberman has come to seek and save those who are lost. Now the more traditional trans or translation is the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man is Jesus' favorite self-designation. We've talked about this before. In Jewish literature, uh, biblical and otherwise, the Son of Man was this messianic figure. Uh, he was expected to appear at the end of time to judge uh, to judge all the people. And, and as Jesus uses the term, it, it takes on some additional meaning as well. That, that is, it becomes more like the sense of he's the man of mans. He is the ultimate or the uber man. He is, as the common English uh, uh, Bible says, he is the human one. With the emphasis kind of on the human one. And, and, and while uh, history was sent into decline through the actions of one man, Right? And by the way, the Hebrew word for man is, do you know what it is? Adam or Adam. It, it would be redeemed through the actions of the son of Adam, the son of man. But note that according to Jesus, the, the son of Adam isn't there to judge, but he's to save. The, the story of Zacchaeus perfectly illustrates and, and, and dramatically illustrates Jesus' mission and Jesus' emphasis as the Son of Man, the Son of Adam. He, he is not just, he's not there to judge, he is there to save. And, and Jesus has come because lost lives matter. Uh, people were, were looking for a judge at that point because they thought that it would be in their best interest if they had somebody who was more judgmental to come to save them. But Jesus didn't come to judge the world but to seek out and to save the lost people. Uh, and there are echoes of uh, John 3.17 here. Uh, everyone remembers John 3.16, right? But John 3.17 says God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Jesus has come because lost lives matter. And, and that's the key point this morning. Jesus has come because lost lives matter. Now, I've got uh, three quick takeaways from this. And the first one is this. We are better off if we own up to our lostness. We are better off if we own up to our lostness. 
But nobody really wants to admit that they are lost, that they don't know what they're doing. It's a lot more fun to figure things out without asking for directions, isn't it? Unless your wife is demanding that you do. Well, there's actually a lot less of this than there used to be, right? Now I just say, okay, Google. Okay, Google. Where am I? Here's a map of Phoenix. <laughs> it shows me right where I am. Okay, Google, plot me a route. Plot me a route home. It plots a route home. I, I, I don't have to worry about being lost anymore, right? I mean, it's just pretty, you know, that solves one major relational problem for men. Um, and, and I'm also very proud that I can use the latest technology that, and, and that pride can overshadow the fear of appearing to be out of control. When you're lost, you are out of control, so you don't want to appear like you are lost. And, 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 but the technology, um, and, and all-knowing Google, can't really tell you how to fix your life, right? If you say, hey Google, um, how can I have a life that is close to God? Or, or how, how can I get my life together? And, and sometimes Google will answer with a bunch of stuff, but it's kind of mumbo jumbo, and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But it, it doesn't have to be complicated. If, if, if you acknowledge your sense of lostness to God, you are positioning yourself to receive direction and restoration from that's what Jesus came to do, to get us back on track, to seek those who are lost and to save the lost. And, and most of the world could actually, I'll tell you, this is a secret. Well, it's not a secret, you know it. Most of the world could actually care less what you do with your life. But Jesus came because even when we are lost, your life matters. Jesus came because lost lives matter. Now, when, when did Zacchaeus realize, uh, first realize that he was lost, uh, a lost person? It's, it's kind of difficult to say. Uh, was it when he uh, decided that he needed to see Jesus? No matter what the obstacles uh, were in his way, he was going to get to see Jesus? Or was it when Jesus called him down out of the tree and invited himself to have dinner with Zacchaeus? Or was it when the crowd started to rehearse Zacchaeus' sins in front of Jesus? I, I, I don't know. But, but in verse 8, he, Zacchaeus starts to acknowledge his lostness, his sinfulness, and he does so through repentance. And, and that's the second takeaway from here. We receive when we repent. We receive when we repent. And, and, and repent is the English power word this week. It's, it's, it's not used so often in common English, but it's important to know Repent means to turn around, turn from the things that are wrong, uh, the thing, the, turn from the things which are, are leading us further astray and things that are causing us to be lost. It, it means to reorient. It means to make a change in your life. Verse 8, the embarrassed Zacchaeus acknowledged the legitimacy of the crowd's reaction in his response to Jesus. Look, Lord, I'm a changed man. I hereby give half of what I have to the poor, and whatever I have swindled will be repaid four times over. Indeed, this was a change of direction for Zacchaeus. Caring for the poor? Really? Zacchaeus? The tax collector? Caring what, about the poor? Oh, or repaying with interest those people from whom he had swindled extra tax money, which is inferred here that he pocketed tax money. When it talks about being a tax collector, everybody assumes that that's what was going on. That was a common practice among tax collectors, uh, not repaying, but, but overcharging and then pocketing the extra. And I mean, you think governments are corrupt now. 
It, it, it ran rampant at that point. It was expected that a tax collector would collect some for himself. So he declares to Jesus in earshot of all around him, I repent. And, and Jesus responds in verse 9 by declaring him reconnected to his Jewish roots and, and the salvation that comes through the kind of faith first exhibited by the ancestor Abraham 2,000 years earlier. Jesus said, today is the day of salvation for this man and his household. Obviously, this kind of faith shows that Zacchaeus is to be counted among the true children of Abraham. That's a powerful statement, especially considering how lost Zacchaeus had been. Society had written him off. He was... He was written off as a lost cause. He was beyond redemption. He was outside of the people of God. But suddenly, at the word of Jesus, he is included. He is restored. And the same is true uh, today when lost people respond to Jesus acting in faith, taking the radical step of repentance. I mean, think about it, how radical this was. Uh, how was Zacchaeus going to actually function if he gave half of his wealth to the poor and compensated those whom he had cheated four times, compensated four times over those whom he had cheated? None of that was possible, human speaking. He had already spent the money. But, but, but faith assumes an act of God. And we already know that God was on the prowl in the area, doing miraculous things through his son Jesus, not the least of which was saving the short crook who oversaw the tax collection scam. Are there people whom you have written off as too lost? People who are too far gone? Jesus has become, Jesus has come because lost lives matter. Thirdly, Jesus' mission is our mission. Jesus' mission is our mission. Verse 10 again, the uberman has come to seek and save those who are lost. It, it, it's interesting that the disciples do not enter into this story in verses 1 through 10. But if we look at the entirety of the Gospel of Luke as a disciple training manual, it, it becomes clear that Jesus wants his what he wants his followers to do. And, and that is to follow, to follow in his footsteps, to imitate him. And, and that means caring about the lost, for Jesus has come because lost lives matter. If, if the broken and, and lost matter so much to Jesus, will they matter less to his followers, the people that, who have themselves been restored, those who have signed on to continue his mission in the world, if they don't matter to us, then we are not actually following Jesus, no matter what we say, no matter how we talk. If, if, if we are a follower of Jesus, then we will be following Jesus. We will be imitating, we will be doing what he does. And, and how the care is expressed might vary, uh, but it will be in some way tangible. Uh, and it'll be, it'll, um, it'll be working out in our lives as well. So, are, are you beginning to see how this is more than a cute Sunday school story? Uh, the story of Zacchaeus spells out how it is that Jesus wants us, wants you to invest your life. Uh, he, he's calling you, he's calling us, to be available to Zacchaeus, to, to care about the lost lives, to care about the broken, to care about the enemy, to care about the pathetic, to care about the unreliable people, to care about the terrorists, to care about the cheats and the scumbags who intend to harm us all. But when you really think about it, you realize that they are us. I, I'm not so different from them. I'm not so different from Zacchaeus, except for the grace of God. And, and that's a really adult way 
of understanding the situation. Jesus has come because lost lives matter. And that is good news. Who would like to share an additional insight into the story of Zacchaeus? Or ask a question. Maybe something kind of caught your attention. You want to know a detail. Or, or even share a brief word about how you have seen God at work in your life or the world around you. My question is, and you should be people doing this. I don't know, I, this is what I understand about people, what they understand about the meaning of the pain. I think many, many people, they think, oh, I just, when I pray to God, I just repent my sin. I just say, oh, God, I sin against you. I do something wrong, and then nothing. That's, partial, that's not real repentance. If you just say, I'm sorry, or say, I'm going to go in a different direction. But full repentance is a turnaround. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is saying it, and it is going in a different direction as well. And I think some people, um, a lot of people do this one, this one, like this, They just say it and yeah, yeah. But in, 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 in the Bible, mm -hmm. in, in the New Testament, mm -hmm. the, the word that's used for repent literally means to be going in one direction and to turn around and go in a different direction. So it means they have to change their it life. It means that you, not that you change your life, but that you allow God to change your life. It means that you embrace the change that God is, God is taking, or God is implementing in your life. So, yes, okay. In this way, we allow God to change our life. Yes. And then what we have to do at the beginning, and then we so show us to allow God to change our life. It, and, and, and practically speaking, it means that when we change, we are turning directions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, but we're facing a different direction, we're going in a different direction. That's what repentance is. It's to change directions. I used to be going towards serving myself, mm -hmm. and now I'm looking at God and I'm going towards serving Him. Mm -hmm. So this actually the repent, the meaning. Let's let the people they understand. Oh, I just say I'm sorry, I, I do something wrong, and and ask God to no, help me. That's good. That's a good start, but it's only a part of the process. Mm -hmm. The part, the fullness of it is to turn and, and go move in a different direction. So how about other people? They don't say this one. They don't, they don't, they don't, and when they pray, they don't say, oh God, I did something wrong, I against you. They don't say this one, but they actually change their direction to follow God, the instruction. And this means they exactly to be plan, or they don't do some, they don't really plan. Yeah, there is what, a... What, what, what do you mean? Because some people think that they don't... Jesus repent. tells the story about two sons. It's two sons. And, and um, the father in one of them tells the son to go do something. Mm -hmm. And he says he'll go do it. Yes. But then he doesn't really do it. Mm -hmm. Then he tells the other son to go do something, and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Then he, he goes and does it anyway. He, he changes his, mm -hmm. his, his mind and does it anyway. And then the second is the one that understands. It's not just the one that says, but it's the one who actually yeah. changes. So, in my yeah. understanding, actually, the reprint, not about what we say, it's about what, about what we do. It's more about what we do than what we say, even though saying is a part of it. So how about if we don't say it, and we just do it, it's not, it's not depend, it means, well, I think it's more powerful than to just say it. Maybe so, maybe so.